give you a sense of uh, where we are going with an executive order that I signed yesterday evening and with new guidance as it relates to large uh, non-essential events, 250 or more in the state of California. And we will walk through details of the Grand Princess as well uh, as those operations are now moving into their final phase. Just a beginning update, 198 individuals uh, in the state of California uh, have been tested positive. Uh, that's in addition of 21 individuals from yesterday, 10 percent roughly uh, increase from yesterday. As you know, we had our fourth uh, tragic loss of life uh, in uh, Southern California, Los Angeles area, uh, Santa Clara, Placer County, up here, and of course uh, now down in L.A. Uh, we are currently uh, uh, in, re well, we have currently 8,227 uh, kits. Uh, or capacity to test. We have over 8,000 uh, tests available. Uh, we have currently conducted some 1,573 tests in the state of California. I continue uh, to reinforce that the tests are not complete, meaning the test kits do not include in every case the RNA uh, extraction kits, the reagents, the chemicals, the solutions that are components of the broader test. This is imperative uh, that the federal government uh, and labs across the United States, not just the state of California, get the benefit of all the ingredients that are components of the test. Uh, I am surprised this is not more of the national conversation. We need to focus in on these tests. I will remind you, it's not completely um, well, I think it's very much in line, these tests, with you're going to the store and purchasing a printer, but forgetting to purchase the ink. So you need multiple components. And so it's incumbent uh, upon all of us to make sure those components are intact. That said, uh, we are trans transitioning and transferring those components throughout our 18 labs that are currently testing throughout the state of California. So some labs have tests but don't have the reagents. We're sending uh, those reagents down to those labs. That's an example here in Sacramento, and we're addressing those things in real time. Quest, as you know, uh, has been in operation in San Juan Capistrano uh, since the beginning of the week. They have been conducting 1,200 tests a day, yesterday and the day before. As I mentioned uh, 24, 48 hours ago, uh, we are looking forward to two new Quest Labs coming online in the state of California uh, by the end of the month, and that will provide testing capacity at those, at those three commercial labs uh, north of 5,000 tests a day. We're also looking to centralize testing locations and been working overtime. We have another meeting today at 2.30 uh, to consider multiple sites throughout the state of California, working with county partners. Uh, to set up centralized testing sites so we can have a significant increase capacity of testing that will aid and uh, advance our efforts not only uh, on efficiency but also focus on addressing the needs of our frontline employees in, throughout our system to focus on uh, the traditional challenges that they face during flu season and the traditional challenges they face with incoming patients, not just corona, uh, or novel corona cases. So those. Uh, those centralized facilities we hope are up and running uh, by next week. And as I said, we're working overtime uh, to secure the resources and a resourceful mindset uh, to get those operationalized. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as you know, we're still able to send tests out of state partners uh, with the other commercial lab. Uh, and we now have four other uh, points of testing in the state of California with Stanford uh, doing tests now. Uh, UC uh, LA, UC San Diego, and the City of Hope. Uh, those four hospitals uh, are also providing tests in addition to Quest, in addition to the 18 state labs. We have uh, expectation that as early as next week, Kaiser uh, will start testing, and we're working with UC Davis and UC Irvine uh, to complement those efforts. So we'll go from four to potentially seven hospital sites uh, as early as next week, in addition to Quest, uh, which will go from one testing facility in San Juan Capistrano 
to two additional testing facilities, uh, we hope, uh, by the end of the month. So I'm giving you a broad overview of our testing protocols, testing capacity. Uh, they are improving, but there's still uh, challenges, and we need to own up to that, and we need to be forthright and honest about what those are. And I'm happy when I'm clued uh, to answer more detailed questions if you have them on that topic. Uh, as it relates to the Grand Princess, uh, 1,963 people are now off the boat as of last night. Uh, we have 511 people that we were able to get off the ship yesterday. Uh, we hope by the end of the day an additional 476 individuals uh, will get off the Grand Princess, uh, substantially uh, uh, now uh, concluding uh, the more challenging part uh, of this process. Uh, this was the day we had hoped to conclude that process, and broad strokes we have. Save the crew, which we discussed, would be quarantined on the boat, and now uh, some foreigners that we're also trying to manage, and that is the cohort uh, that we are working overtime to address. Uh, we anticipate uh, that by the end of this evening, 1,075 crew members will still be on board that ship. As you know, a few crew members went back on these repatriated flights uh, to Canada and to the United Kingdom. Uh, not all of them, just a handful of them. Uh, we're working with the embassies uh, across the world, but all of them, uh, most of them in the Bay Area that we have been in contact with, the embassy of Korea, South Korea, Japan, uh, India, uh, Philippines, substantively, uh, to address the needs, not only the crew, but the remaining foreigners that are still on board. Uh, we have three uh, flights scheduled, Miramar uh, today, one to Dobbins uh, in Georgia. As you know, uh, Lachlan is only accepting Texas passengers, not American citizens that are not from Texas. That's disappointing. Um, folks in Georgia are doing more, and the people, of course, of the state of California have always done more. That is not helped in our logistics, to be candid with you, uh, but it is what it is, uh, and that's why there are no additional uh, flights into Texas. They're only taking Texans. Uh, they're not taking other American citizens, unlike Georgia and unlike the state of California. Uh, we are well aware, as you have all reported, of some logistical issues that, um, uh, that uh, have been frustrating uh, as it relates to um, provisions on the Air Force bases uh, for these passengers that have come off the Grand Princess and have gone to our military bases. Uh, we are working overtime and in real time to improve those. Uh, but as you know, that's a federal operation. That's not an abdication. Uh, but we have uh, little jurisdiction on uh, those military sites, but we certainly are strongly supporting those efforts and are hopeful that we'll see a substantial improvement as those individuals uh, go to these sites and are quarantined for that 14-day period. Uh, you know that there were a number of people off the ship that went to hospitals. Uh, as of last night, there were just eight individuals remaining. Uh, in those hospitals. Uh, the rest have been sent to multiple sites. Two sites uh, that we have secured, one Silomar uh, State Park uh, site. We're putting individuals uh, into some of our assets on that state park. Uh, again, there are state parks and then there are parks uh, that have substantial inadequate facilities. This is one of those state parks with substantial infrastructure and facilities. Uh, and we also secured, as many of you are well aware, a 120-room hotel in San Carlos. Uh, and we've been working very collaboratively with the county down there, local authorities, and that will provide access uh, for those individuals that were otherwise in our acute care facilities and our hospitals to be transported uh, to these locations. As you can imagine, under our pandemic planning, we're also looking to secure additional assets, additional hotels, motels, other uh, resources. We discussed a few days ago uh, my proclamation of a state of emergency that affords us the opportunity to do that on state lands, fairgrounds, armories, and the like. Uh, I'll talk to you in a moment about our executive order that further advances that uh, cause as well. So that's, that's broad strokes where we are uh, with the folks coming off uh, the ship. Uh, for what it's worth, um, we had uh, four people yesterday 
uh, or rather, excuse me, five people yesterday that also went to the hospital. We expect uh, potentially a few more today. Uh, again, very managed, uh, manageable, and obviously uh, we are encouraged by the fact that the original 36, only eight remain, which suggests their health is much better than was originally assumed, and that's very good news. Uh, for those of you who are curious how many people have come off the ship that have been tested positive, those tests are happening in real time. Uh, we are aware uh, of a number of people that have been tested positive that have come off the ship in addition to the 21 that were originally tested, two uh, that were passengers, 19 that were crew members, one in Canada uh, and one down in Miramar. But that information is coming in real time. That's all I know about those individuals at this stage. Uh, we will be collecting that data and providing it as soon uh, as we are in receipt of that information. As you know, many of these people have just arrived on these sites. Uh, we are just procuring uh, not only their accommodations, but their necessities. And once those are done, then they'll begin the testing regime. Again, all of these individuals will be tested, but not all of them have been tested. Again, this repatriation effort from the cruise ship into the Port of Oakland, into these military sites, not just in California, but across the country, Texas and Georgia, is a real-time operation. Once people are settled, they'll be tested, quarantined, and we'll have that information uh, to provide you. Uh, we, pursuant to that executive order last night, made uh, an additional announcement, as I referenced a moment ago, uh, related specifically to non-essential events in the state of California. Uh, it is not only our strong recommendation, but codified in the executive order. Uh, that we have directed cities, counties, uh, private, public sector, large and small, all throughout the state of California, um, uh, to no longer permit uh, large non-essential events uh, in this state, sporting events, other types of conferences, music festivals, and the like, fill in the blank, and I'm happy to fill in the blank. Uh, we believe that was appropriate based upon a number of factors, not least of which uh, our collaboration and coordination with the CDC. As you know, yesterday, um, mid-morning, mid-day, uh, the CDC put out protocols and guidelines for a similar number of individuals, uh, 250 or larger for non-essential gathering, in the county of Santa Clara. Uh, that was just one county. Uh, we felt more appropriate uh, to begin uh, to advance that process throughout all 58 counties in the state of California. We've been working uh, with our local partners, uh, and that has been broadly supported. And while it is a directive, while it is a guidance, uh, its legal authority is limited uh, in from an enforcement perspective. I know this is a question many of you have, but I have all the expectation that it will be advanced and will be adopted. Invariably, you're going to ask, well, what happens if it isn't? I'm not concerned about that. But I can assure you we have the tools in our toolkit if, indeed, we needed to move forward with stepped-up capacity. We have the ability, I, the ability as governor, uh, to enforce, but I don't expect we'll need to do that. Uh, I think people recognize the imperative of this moment and the importance <coughs> for non-essential events uh, to limit that social uh, interaction and the mixing of different groups, particularly for our seniors and those with compromised immune systems. And in that respect, we have also put out guidelines to limit to 10 the number of individuals in those categories that come into congregate settings, uh, that come into uh, contact with one another. So those are the protocols we put out. Those are the parameters. Uh, invariably, I think you're going to see this not only across the state of California, where we have seen this pursuant to our directive last night, but across uh, other parts of the country. Uh, very shortly. So that includes uh, all large athletic events. Uh, that includes, uh, uh, obviously, not just uh, uh, private concerts and private uh, uh, functions, large conferences and the like, but clearly uh, sporting events uh, that would impact not just the NBA with their unique set of circumstances, but Major League Baseball, uh, which is moving towards opening day very shortly, and others. Uh, that effective, that directive is effective for the rest of this month. Uh, we will extend it as necessary, and it's likely it will be extended. We didn't want to put a firm timeline, uh, but we want to give people a sense of what to expect. Uh, and we've been socializing that uh, throughout uh, the state over the course of the last 24, 40, 48 hours. 
It does not include um, at the moment, and I can explain, and I will explain why, uh, casinos, uh, card rooms. It does not include right now theaters, uh, and it does not include uh, large parks like Disneyland. I had a conversation with Bob Iger yesterday. Uh, we've been meeting with uh, our partners uh, in our tribal nations. Uh, we've been meeting uh, with leaders, those respective industries. Uh, the complexity of their unique circumstances requires additional conversation, uh, different, uh, different kind of engagement, and in real time, we're in those conversations and engagement. The reason we didn't do it was because the complexity of their unique circumstances, but I assure you, we are moving quickly and effectively towards a resolution in those spaces. Uh, and again, this is with the advice and counsel, not only the folks behind me, uh, but with the direct engagement of those individuals that would be impacted, uh, they raised enough legitimate concerns and questions in the short run that we felt it appropriate to exclude them from this general order today and advance those conversations with earnest uh, later this afternoon uh, and hopefully have some clarity and guidelines uh, in the uh, very immediate future uh, in terms of those venues. Uh, final uh, point. On the executive order, uh, there are a number of things included in that. I referenced um, that the issue of finding access to hotels and motels and sites where we could quarantine and isolate individuals, uh, that is ongoing and has been quite successful. We're looking for folks uh, to uh, find similar assets down in Southern California and San Diego area, uh, Solano. And by the way, thank you to the elected officials in Solano. Thank the community in Solano for stepping up, doing the right thing, and disproportionately, um, uh, well, disproportionately meeting this moment. Uh, I, I just can't repeat that enough, how proud I am of that community uh, and how, uh, how complimented uh, I am by their elected representation and their willingness to work uh, with this administration and the federal government throughout. But we do have in this executive order the ability to commandeer uh, existing uh, private sector assets, uh, including hotels and motels. That was one of uh, the directives in the executive order. Another directive in the executive order uh, allows for uh, the ability for individuals that are impacted by uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, not to face penalty and fines associated uh, with their tax uh, preparation for state taxes. This is not completely dissimilar uh, to the federal rules that were advanced by the president yesterday. We'll do the same or similar uh, rulemaking pursuant to that executive order uh, for state taxes. Uh, we also are looking to waive the one-week requirement on unemployment insurance and the one-week requirement on disability insurance, i.e. sick leave. And so we have already directed uh, our Department of Labor to do just that, and that, again, was codified in that executive order that was signed last night. Bagley Keene issues, Brown Act issues, folks at home may not know what those mean. Every one of you uh, knows and understands those things intimately. Those also, those provisions and those appropriate protections for public transparency and accountability to the public uh, are being preserved, but telephonically through technology and through other means and mechanisms, we laid those out uh, a full page of uh, our executive order just lays out the details of Bagley Keene and details of the Brown Act, but still provide public access, still provide the ability for the public to be notified, but still allows us to conduct ourselves at the state and local level uh, with the public trust always front and center. Uh, and so that is another part of that executive order. I can continue, but want to just highlight uh, one additional, uh, well, two additional more substantive parts of the executive order that has to do with the issue of lab testing um, and scope of practice and the issues related to EMS and paramedics as it relates to scope of practice and the issue of being able to get retired annuitants uh, to be part and participatory of this moment uh, and allow folks out of state to come in and be part and participatory to meet this moment. Uh, so allowing us additional resources uh, in respect to accessing uh, the state rules in a way that provide more flexibility. So that's broad strokes uh, where the executive order lies, the directive on uh, social gatherings uh, in excess for non-essential 
um, uh, events, 250 or more, uh, and we continue in closing uh, to work on the essential events. And for me, essential includes schools. I put out directives on Saturday as it relates to schools, and if they do move forward uh, to uh, moving towards the possibility of closures, what those protocols and procedures would look like. As you know, just two days ago, we met with all the superintendents to lay that out. All of that is happening in real time as community spread occurs in different counties. Different school districts are impacted differently. Different schools individually are impacted differently. Uh, but we do deem that schools are essential, not non-essential. But we lay out, as we did in those directives on Saturday, specific strategies and protocols as it relates to assisting our children, but also assisting our faculty and staff, not just our teachers, in protecting themselves uh, from spread. And as you know, they include, among other things, staggering PE, making sure that assemblies are canceled, making sure that we are providing meals in the classroom or in other isolated settings, common sense as it relates to sanitation and distancing, uh, and trying to concentrate classrooms and not mix them with other classrooms. And that's just common sense. That would extend to the private sector workforce, not just our public schools as well. So I just want to be clear on that because we have seen private schools, charter schools, clearly institutions of higher learning uh, that have begun to shut down uh, their traditional classrooms uh, and have turned online. Uh, we, as you know, uh, have that capacity in some districts, but not in other districts. And I'll remind you, 60% of the students in the state of California are in reduced uh, school lunch or meal programs, some breakfast programs as well. Uh, and as I referenced, you have some, like Merced, that 80% of that student body has in reduced uh, meal uh, programs. So there is a deep socioeconomic consideration and, in closing, a workforce consideration. If you are a caregiver of a loved one, a police officer, firefighter, emergency room doctor, nurse, nurse practitioner, and you have kids, and you have no capacity to have those kids at home without your own presence being there, you no longer are part of then the workforce to meet this moment. And that's why, again, we have to be very thoughtful and consider it as it relates to our education system and the broader impacts, uh, including if we do close, how to feed these kids uh, and how to protect these kids uh, and make sure they're real caregivers that are there uh, to secure their needs if indeed they are back home. So that's where we are uh, in broad strokes today. Um, I will say this, and forgive me for repeating this, none of this surprises us and I hope doesn't surprise you um, I continue to try to lean in with transparency and where I think we're going um, and clearly as it relates to social distancing uh, with these non-essential events, this is where we need to go next and to make sure we fully implement uh, those procedures and protocols to slow down the spread, to get through a peak and to get through the next few months so we don't overwhelm our healthcare delivery system and we can meet this moment, protect people uh, and do our best uh, to address not just the health, uh, but public safety and economic consequences uh, of this moment. And so with all of that uh, said, we're happy to answer any questions. Governor, you mentioned that some of these tests don't have all of the components. Does that mean you can still use them? So do we still have the capacity of 8,000 tests? If we don't yeah, we, 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 have, we have 8,227 tests that we believe we have the capacity to conduct. And we are distributing those throughout our system, uh, not just the state labs, but these local labs. But there's 18 labs in that system currently. 19 labs are in possession of test kits. 18 are currently utilizing those test kits. To the extent there are backlogs in certain local labs because they don't have all the components, we have already engaged Quest to then begin to test those backlogged kits to the extent they don't have all the components. As of this morning, we do not have any backlogged tests. So it's a way of reinforcing that currently, because of the partnership with Quest and the nature of how we're distributing all of the ingredients, not just the traditional kits, that we currently are meeting the demand. But again, that demand is limited by the protocols and procedures that are in place. And that's why I want to say again, 
our intention, giving you a sense of where we're going, is to centralize our testing capacity, to partner with our counties, and to provide facilities where we can access substantially greater number of tests with all the component parts in partnership with Quest and other hospitals and labs throughout our system, including outside of the state. And those protocols and procedures are being put in in real time. Again, 2.30 a day, we have another follow-up meeting, and we'll be announcing in detail what those look like and how you access those. So there will not be yet the drive-by facilities that you are uh, seeing and many of you reported about in South Korea elsewhere yet, but these will be stepped-up capacity for people. Uh, that would allow us to bypass the current restrictions on testing uh, that are in place today. Governor, to what extent is the um, limitation on testing a result of like lack of funding for county health departments? Is that a factor here? I, it, to my knowledge, that's not a factor. Um, we're well resourced, uh, and to the extent that any lab and county is in need of additional resources, uh, we are in constant contact and uh, will provide uh, those resources. Look, from a cash-based perspective, this state uh, is in a good position to meet this moment. Uh, we have the support of the federal government, the $8.3 billion appropriation. Uh, obviously, they're loosening up additional access to resources on the UI, uh, and hopefully in the paid sick leave space. That will only uh, further our efforts. Uh, we're in the beginning of our budget year, so the agencies and state departments, including local, have not expended. Uh, they're not at the end of that uh, fiscal year cycle, uh, so we feel we have ample resources. So why is, why is Quest Labs able to come in and provide the reagents and the personnel then? The, like, why don't the county labs have those? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's an issue that we have expressed very publicly and privately, and it's an issue that needs to be resolved quickly. And I was very clear about that two days ago with all of you. We've been very clear with our federal partners, the incredible importance of making sure we have all the components of testing um, and that uh, we are provided those in real time. Quest and other commercial labs, this is all they do 24-7. And in many of these labs, including the two that will come online by the end of the month, particularly here in California, these are automated tests. In essence, it's all in one kit that then allows them to move forward. Otherwise, it's separate components. Uh, these are more automated systems. As part of the after action, I assure you I'll be standing here, and hopefully in a number of months, talking about what occurred and dust settles and ways to improve. This will be an imperative for the federal government in partnerships with states and municipalities, large and small across the country, to address going forward so we're not just reliant on these commercial labs for these completely integrated tests. Can you put in there, uh, in the Elk, an Elk Grove nursing care facility was one of the people who died from this virus. Has everyone in that facility been provided a test? Do we know that there aren't other seniors in that home? Yeah, all of them. Well, we're monitoring all of them, and, and Dr. Galley could talk more about where they are in the protocols of testing. So we're working closely with the facility, first and foremost, to make sure that we have um, eyes on all the residents, making sure that the staff are taken care of as well, because we know that this is a vulnerable group, uh, susceptible to severe disease, and our first and foremost priority is to ensure that they're getting the care that they need. Additionally, we are working to make sure that those who need testing, that we have it available, and are working with the facility to determine who, who will get tested uh, uh, very soon. Are there concerns that like an employee from that facility might have spread it? to the surrounding community? Uh, so certainly. I mean, we know that there's uh, widespread transmission, right? So um, you, what we are certainly focused on is ensuring that people who have been in that facility are given all the guidance that they need to understand how transmission happens, to keep away from people in their community that are also equally susceptible, that they, that they uh, if they develop symptoms, that we get them the care and testing that they need right away. And this is certainly a very important moment for California, one of the first facilities that take, takes care of um, older Californians with a case and, in fact, a death. Um, 
that we are taking it very seriously to make sure that we lead, lean in, and um, uh, under the governor's guidance uh, to, to really push forward and make sure that other facilities that we're very vigilant in making sure that not just residents but staff are given the attention that they need. So why only test people if they show symptoms, staff and residents? We are working on the protocol right now to determine how many we can test right away. Um, I expect that we'll be testing uh, all, almost all of the residents that uh, are, are in that facility, not only because it gives us an opportunity to make sure those residents um, are, are safe and protected against COVID-19, but it also uh, creates an opportunity to understand in a facility such as this with one known case with a pretty significant uh, uh, you know, mortality outcome, how many people are in fact infected and it helps us do what the governor has been asking us to do, which is really get in front of surveillance. This is sort of a targeted surveillance moment as well. What about visitors coming in testing now? kits? Um, just to understand, did we know that the other tests that we were getting from the federal government did not have all the pieces and we just wanted whatever we could get to match with what we not did Not, not in the beginning of this process. Okay, we didn't know that they weren't. Not in the beginning tests. of the process. Okay. Yeah, and it became clear when we had some ambiguity. We, well, we were referencing the number of test kits and we were then getting queries back from some of our local labs saying, well, we can't use these test kits. And then obviously it led to a series of questions and then deeper understanding uh, of what these kits were and what they weren't as it relates to the reagents, as it relates to the RNA extraction kits that weren't always a component of the tests that were being provided. Uh, again, the CDC is well aware of this. We've made it crystal clear. I had a conversation with the Vice President directly individually yesterday morning about this, and uh, we're, they're working real time to start providing them. But again, the good news in this respect is concurrent to those conversations to address those gaps in those testing protocols, the commercial labs are now coming on board. And as I noted, they are substantially advancing our efforts to test comprehensively. 1,200 tests on Tuesday, 1,200 tests on Wednesday, 100 tests, just to put in perspective, on Monday. So they're significantly ramping up capacity. When we open that West Hill site, the Sacramento site, the end of the month, or by the end of the month, uh, of getting as much as 5,000 potentially 5,500. Interestingly and importantly, those tests are not just for California residents. I don't want to mislead you. Uh, those tests roughly today are about 50% uh, of California samples. Uh, these are testing labs uh, that are absorbing people from out of state. Accordingly, uh, we know doctors are sending tests out of state individually to commercial labs for the benefit of California residents as well. What we are putting together and we'll start providing this information, is uh, a aggregated number. I gave you the number of tests we've done to date uh, in terms of, of the 1,575, but we have now with these hospitals coming online, not just the labs coming online, uh, we are going to have to collect all of those, uh, those uh, all that data and begin to report that. And as uh, we increase the number of testing facilities, including these congregate sites uh, and these community sites, uh, the testing numbers are going to start increasing significantly. We talked right. about confirmed cases. Do you have any numbers on the people who have the coronavirus and are now healthy? Um, I'll leave that. Dr. Angel, do you have <clears throat> that information? We don't have the complete information on the resolution, but we are following very closely when people are getting into trouble, when we have people in ICUs, et cetera, and, and following those courses. So no confirmed number on resolution? Not at this time, no. Governor, you mentioned that these tests are something we're going to be reflecting on in a couple months and talking about these test kits and parts we don't have. Yeah. So I'm curious if what you're saying now is that because we don't have all these parts that we're having a limited ability to test in some areas, and like, what is your greater concern about this? Uh, my greater concern is we could be testing a lot more people in the aggregate. And, and obviously it's our intention to prioritize testing so we have a sense of what we're dealing with. It's a critical component in all of this. It's just a component that's been lost. We talk about test kits. It's more complicated than that. And forgive me, uh, make something uh, complicated, but this is profoundly important part of the conversation we're not having nationally about the tests. Uh, they are now having those conversations. And as I said, we, we can lament about it, we can focus on it, uh, or we can recognize that we're addressing it and we have these new commercial labs, private hospitals, 
and others that are now uh, helping supplement that. And so I feel more confident as we move forward in the next days and weeks, including these community facilities, congregate uh, testing sites that we intend to open up that we'll get through this. But it's just a component that explains why you get calls from local labs saying we can't test, and I'm here at the podium saying here are the thousands of tests we have in the state. It is both of those things have been true, and the ambiguity lies in looking at the totality of the ingredients that often is not universally uh, supplied. And so right now this is impeding our ability to fight this virus in California. I, I'm going to leave. That, that's that's uh, I, I appreciate where you're going with that, and I appreciate uh, the frame of your question. Uh, we want to test more people. Uh, we look forward to significantly increasing our testing capacity. Uh, this has been an issue in terms of providing more tests, uh, and we hope it is resolved very quickly. Governor, when it comes to education of students in the state of California, a lot of the districts that have either pulled back or talking about pulling back all have, seem to have this online component of offering classes. I'm talking about public school. Yeah. Um, as what the next step may be, what they're informing parents about. What kind of conversations have been had about educational equity? Because a lot of students yep. may not be able to have that laptop or Wi-Fi yeah. access at home, depending on yeah. um, their family makeup, where they live. Yeah, all the above, and that's why I referenced in relation to the schools, school lunch program uh, as a proxy for that point of view, and obviously uh, geographic concerns, rural versus urban, dense uh, versus uh, uh, communities that don't have uh, the benefits of, of the components of social learning, or rather distance learning, online learning capacity and the like. So yeah, it's a point of real concern uh, that those that can do and those that can't uh, are unable. And so we've got to address that and we're trying to do that working with our superintendent. It's exactly again, forgive me for belaboring this, why I met with all uh, the 58 county superintendents to understand those nuances, complexities. Two days ago we talked about those complexities not just being from a socioeconomic perspective in the traditional uh, terms but also through the lens of immigration and other lens that we have to look at, transportation, uh, geographic distribution, uh, meaning concentrated districts, large districts versus small districts. I'll give you a specific. Just addressing meal hubs, it's easy in a small district. It's much more difficult in a large district. Where are those meal, meal hubs? Are they going to be in libraries? Uh, where can we provide parks, uh, those points of access? Uh, do you, for example, uh, if you're going to have meal hubs to address the needs low-income kids, uh, do you order online? If you don't have the capacity to do that, how do you then access uh, those orders so you have a sense of what that need is? All of those things, I assure you, in real time, deeply through the lens of equity, um, what we do best in California, uh, are being considered. Governor, what is order on social or mass gatherings? You mentioned the issue of enforcement. I mean, how, how do you address the issue of enforcement in They'll do the right thing. I, I see people doing the right thing. I think we are hardwired, I believe, to do the right thing. And in all the conversations we've had with our local health officials, I, I think the vast majority, in fact, in the conversations, overwhelming, universal, said we're going to do the right thing. So I'm not, I, we can be fixated on that, and it's a point of interest, and it might be a point of some consideration. It's not for me. Here's why. Because I know what I can do to address that in real time. And I don't think I'm going to have to do it, but I'm prepared to do it. So I know they're going to do the right thing. But well, why not just take that step? Because it's unnecessary. Why take a step that's unnecessary when people are naturally going to do the right thing? They've been directed. The executive order codifies it, and they said they'll do it. Um, many times you don't have to penalize people or even threaten to penalize them when they say, well, we're happy to comply. So do you not a concern. To be like a, I mean, is this it's already happening. No, I'll, re I'll repeat what I, for even more clarity, um, no, because I don't expect the need to do that. What about, uh, you mentioned earlier that Disneyland and like casinos, for example, what about their situation is more complex to the extent that well, they like the Dodgers or the Lakers? Or the Kings? Well, Disneyland, I think, what, has a thousand people on a ride every hour. They have concerts, they have theaters, they have parades. I mean, that's a, that's a nation state uh, on a campus environment in Anaheim. I mean, that's a whole different thing. Um, the complexity within the theater system is interesting as well. 
Uh, they are advancing some social distancing protocols. They're looking to stagger, just as your seats are currently staggered. Uh, 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 the show times, et cetera, and new considerations of queuing uh, lines in their facilities. They're working with us in real time on those protocols, and they are providing hybrid considerations for us, and that's why we agreed to work with them uh, to address those issues um, and, uh, and to provide guidance uh, with them. It includes casinos as well. What, as, far as, as far as amusement parks, it goes beyond Disneyland. Have you been, have you been talking like Universal? Correct. Uh, yeah, so Park. Jeff Shell, we, we've been in contact with all of them, and uh, we'll continue to work collaboratively with them, but that is correct. It does well, not include amusement parks. I, I asked you this last time. I mean, how, how, are, how is your administration and, and your close advisors, how are you guys functioning? Have you been tested? Has your family been tested? Uh, I'm, you know what? I, I will test any other human being that's older than me, they deserve a test before someone like me deserves a test. So the answer is unequivocally absolutely no. I have no symptoms. And you know what? Even if I did, I'd prioritize people that need it the most. The last thing we need to do in this circumstance is take care of ourselves without taking care of the people. And so my priority, my administration's priority is you first. But that said, I care deeply about uh, our team members and care deeply about their families. And they're doing common sense things that you are doing. Uh, and they are practicing what we're preaching in real time, including on the issues of how best to conduct uh, the business of government. And as I noted to you two days ago, CalPERS and others are already doing uh, that. In fact, I think we have today our Future of Work Commission. Now one person is in the same room. So we're already practicing. Uh, forgive me, Zoom just got a, uh, a little nod. We're using Zoom to bring everybody online. And, and so that's just one of many examples of, of what we're, we're doing, the kind of things you and I Everybody else should be doing. So Are your kids still in school? Things happen here in the capital. I mean, this is a place of mass gatherings. That's we're working. Sure. Yeah, we're working with um, state parks on tours, and we'll have uh, some guidance very soon on that. But there's school groups walking around. There's a like hundred people up in the health committee. That's why uh, we're working with state parks, and we're going to give you guidance on that in real time. Uh, we're working with legislative leaders in real time. You saw the pro tem put out a press release. Uh, we are working with her. The Bagley King components, the Brown Act components were essential in terms of their moving to the next step. Those were afforded officially in the executive order last night uh, and in real time will address their needs. But let me say this, we won't just address the needs of elected officials, we'll address the needs of the janitors here, we'll address the needs of the workers here, the folks that are in contact with more people than anybody else and those the security that's afforded here. Everybody deserves that same level of consideration. So. Uh, there is no hierarchy here. Um, there is no protocol that puts any of us above anybody else. Uh, we have a mandate to the people of the state and the most vulnerable. Our priority is for the most vulnerable. And uh, I have confidence that uh, you will have clarity within the next number of hours, uh, perhaps as early uh, or as late rather as tomorrow morning, uh, on details about how this place runs. But I honestly am more committed to the 40 million people that don't reside in this building. There's other places too, right, like courthouses where people feel like they have to come because they have a court date. Essential. Essential, right. Essential so versus non-essential, and that's what we distinguish. Essential, obviously, and that's been excluded from this to some extent, but how do you ensure that those places continue running as we move forward through? We're this? working with the courts. We're working on our partners, uh, working, um, let me give you, let me extend your considerations may be of interest, our jails, our prisons, protocols on visitors, essential versus non-essential visits, all of those things are uh, being considered in real time. Uh, there is not an hour that goes by, hasn't in the last couple of weeks, where we're not on a conference call with partners all throughout the state of California in every capacity of government, at every level of government, trying to work through the anxieties and the logistics in these spaces. So, so a question um, related to where we're going as a state. So obviously Italy is behind or was ahead of us by a few weeks. They're now in a full shutdown. So can you give citizens a sense of what the next steps are, what comes after this and after this and what they should be preparing for broadly? Well, the, the most important thing, it's one thing to, to take a piece of paper and to fix your signature to it. It's another to apply its intent. So it's in the application now uh, that I'm most immediately focused on of the guidance that we put out last night in the executive uh, order. Uh, I continue to posit that it's decisions, not conditions, that will determine 
our fate and future as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, we have agency. We can change the future. It's not some to experience, some to manifest. So it is in the sum total of our individual decisions that we will determine the fate of this virus. We will meet or not meet the moment. I have confidence we'll meet the moment. And so we want to make sure we apply uh, the principles of the social distancing. We want to make sure we secure the needs of our most vulnerable populations. That's why, again, it's not 250, it's 10. We are prioritizing our assisted living facilities, our congregate care facilities, disability communities, which is another big and under-focused area of concern, uh, and making sure uh, that we socialize this in all 480 plus cities in the state and 58 counties in a way uh, that, uh, that uh, is as consistent as we can make it. Then we will move to the next iterations. I remind you, I said a couple days ago, that we're running scenario plans. You're going to see these numbers increase. We've been saying this. I know Dr. Fauci said yesterday, everyone thought, wow, I had no idea this was coming. Of course, none of that should have been a surprise. We've been saying numbers will increase as we start testing more and more folks. And we move from uh, a framework of, you know, trying to track and trace every single point of contact to more of a containment framework. And that's what phase we're in currently, and that's the phase I think we'll be in uh, for a little bit of time. And to the extent uh, we have to prepare for extremes, that's the commandeering component of the executive order. That's the securing of the hotel resources and motel resources and state park resources that have hotel motel components that is already underway. Uh, at 120 bed uh, hotel in San Carlos, we're not going to fill that up today. But the reason we wanted 120 beds is to the extent we need it. We are looking at old mothballed facilities, including hospital sites, to potentially take them over, to scrub them, get them up ready in case we need them. Uh, and, uh, and, we're, and we're willing you know, to be fluid in this. Let me talk about fluidity. And forgive me for belaboring this. This is just important for folks to know. We, as part of the dynamic uh, of considerations in real time and what is happening, not what we thought was going to happen. Uh, we, working with the mayor of Oakland and the port director of the Port of Oakland, uh, they have been spectacular, by the way. That's what partnership is all about. Uh, they felt it appropriate working with the State Department, working with the CDC, ASPR, which is that under HSS, which is the coordinating body that is point uh, with our operation for uh, the Grand Princess to continue to site uh, and to port uh, the uh, ship through Sunday. We were, gonna, we were gonna send it back out to sea today. Everyone felt it was just unnecessary to do that. Uh, even though we have gotten all the Californians off and we'll get substantially everybody else off tonight, save a few uh, foreigners that we are still trying to get back home and get them on appropriate flights. But because there are a few foreigners and are not on there, uh, and because we are looking to get those crews back to their home countries like the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, India, and other places, we felt at least through Sunday uh, we would just uh, keep the ship there. Uh, that, is, uh, that is something, again, all of us concluded was appropriate on the circumstances. Uh, is this an example of the nature of how you need to prepare for anything? Governor, why isn't the Surgeon General here? You created that position. Well, she's, we're in constant contact. I, I, you know, we, we could have a, about 150 people here, and that wouldn't even do justice to the number of people that are operationalized currently. Uh, but she's out. She's talking to our private sector partners. She's actually helping us secure resources. We've got a whole team on innovation, uh, folks coming in with testing kits, this protocol, that protocol, people from around the world, anything. She's uh, assessing all those things. She's done a magnificent job. Governor, are your kids still in school? They are. And um, also, do you think that pu public health response has at all changed because of like limitations on testing? Is it being der like um, designed around that? No, I mean, I, I have no sense of that personally. I've not heard that from any of the superintendents. I didn't hear that from our uh, superintendent of public education. Um, uh, I haven't heard that from principals and teachers that I've been in contact. I'm not concerned about that. Uh, to the extent that becomes an issue, uh, we will immediately disabuse people that it should be an issue. Public health, uh, public safety, first and foremost, uh, we can always make up 
uh, for these moments. Later. Governor, you, you said a couple days ago you were going to look at your options for, I guess, stopping cruise ships from docking in California. Have you done that? Have you made any? Well, one better uh, princess announced uh, they're suspending all cruise ships for the next 60 days. To their credit, Viking immediately responded in kind. To their credit, we hope to hear other announcements similar throughout the rest of the day and the next few days. That's very helpful. And also, do you have, I mean, for, for gatherings of less than 250, I mean, there's a lot of things coming up. We have, you have wed it's wedding season, it's high school prom season. Yeah. What's your advice for people, parents, kids, for things like Common that? Common sense. Uh, again, it's for seniors, for people with compromised immune systems, um, avoid those events. Uh, common sense. We lay out our guidelines in detailed terms of how one should conduct themselves for events that are deemed essential or even non-essential events less than 250 on social distancing, on sanitation practices, what those protocols and procedures should look like. I laid out in detail uh, what we believe the school systems should be doing. Uh, workforce, we expect the same in terms of how desks and tables uh, are organized. Uh, outdoor venues, we distinguish from indoor venues. If you're in a meeting hall in a basement, that's very different than being out in a large uh, public park. Uh, and so all of those things have criteria and consideration that have to be tailored through the application of something that is available to all of us and is a renewable resource, common sense. Governor, in here, why is, uh, forgive me, talk to me a little bit about why car rooms, casinos are kind of getting a pass. I'm not getting a pass, and I was trying to be as clear as I could okay. in real time working through the distinctive nuances of some of these larger parks, amusement parks, how the queuing and lines work, uh, what kind of mixing occurs, how we're addressing their unique needs. We are very soon. We put this order out a number of hours ago. I can assure you, you're going to get clarity on this. Uh, and I don't want to say in the next few hours, but we are working overtime to tighten up all of those considerations. I laid out uh, as an example, not just some of the large amusement parks, but the theater chains that are already, and they provided us more information about what they're already doing and are about to announce that allowed us to step back and say, all right, with those considerations, let's keep working on any ambiguities of consideration. But I assure you, uh, we are leaning in. We're not being passive. I think we're meeting the moment, and we're not going to allow people to be separate and above if it puts the health of the people of the state of California at risk. Oh, sorry. The Sacramento and other counties have um, ended recommendations for 14-day quarantines as part of the mitigation strategy. At what point would it make sense for the state to also end that recommendation? Well, we'll make that determination, but I, I can assure you we didn't believe that appropriate for those repatriated on the Grand Princess. We felt uh, they should be quarantined on the military basis. Uh, not everyone felt that way. There were some health officials that felt they could home quarantine. We didn't think with the totality of people coming off that ship. Remember, we started with 2,421 passengers on that ship. Uh, we felt the system was not prepared to absorb that. So we'll make those determinations in real time. County by county, they're making determinations based on community spread, based on uh, the current conditions within their counties. They are all working hand in glove with Dr. Angel, Dr. Galley, uh, in terms of recommendations, protocols, procedures, and we in turn, of course, very directly with the CDC. So that's the fluidity, that's the dynamic of those decisions. As the testing situation um, improves in the state, if we were to have another cruise ship situation, would the goal be to test everybody on board before you left? I, I, think, the, I think the most important thing we did, and Dr. Red, who was part of the uh, Diamond Princess efforts, versus the Grand Princess, this is the model, not the diamond. They tried to quarantine people in that ship uh, for that 14-day period. More people came into contact with the virus as a consequence. You want to get people off the ship as quickly and effectively and efficiently as possible in a way that doesn't just impact them, but the community and communities you're bringing those people into. And that's a combination of the protocols and process and procedures. So uh, it would be my intent and those tests can't be done within minutes or hours, that we remove people as quickly and efficiently off the boat. But we hope not to be back in this position, because I can assure you uh, this has been a large operation. It has been deeply time-consuming. Uh, but in the process, we've developed very strong relationships with our federal partners, 
uh, and that is going to make us stronger uh, moving forward and more capable. But we don't need many more of these cruise ships coming in on uh, with these kinds of uh, repatriation processes. So, uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You indicated last night that you were going to do something to sort of help the businesses who are going to be impacted by your executive order on you know canceling large gatherings. Can you give us a sense of what you're planning? Well, the unemployment insurance indirectly impacts sick leave, will indirectly impact tax will be not only for individuals, but the tax waiver of penalties and fines is also for businesses. So those are just some pragmatic, specific issues that were laid out in the executive order I signed out last night. We are working very collaboratively with Speaker Pelosi, who's been magnificent. Uh, she has our back. She has the American people's back, but substantively, uh, folks uh, in her district and in the state, and she's been deeply connected, not just individually with me, but her team and our team on where uh, we can best utilize federal support that would help address the anxieties, particularly of small and medium-sized businesses, particularly in the service industries, the hospitality industries that will be disproportionately impacted, specifically wage earners that don't have the benefit of unemployment insurance and in benefit as a workers' comp, do not have retirement benefits that they can access and the like. So you have folks that are part of our, our contribution platform economy, the gig economy, uh, broadly defined. You have folks uh, that are independently uh, working one, two jobs as a waiter here, busboy there. Uh, those are the folks that we are most sensitive to in terms of needs. Uh, and we have Lenny Mendonca here who runs our economic development work in the state. Uh, who has been working 24-7 uh, to try to organize our requests to the federal government and is working with Keely Bosser and our finance team to the extent the state can provide uh, appropriate support. But the state did, in that process, develop the framework for this executive related to wildfires, related to earthquakes, and I've been consistent. Uh, when we are working well together, I express it. When we're not, I'll express it. And I have nothing uh, to say to create a wedge because I would be lying to you. I'd be making something up to fulfill some uh, political lane or some political purpose. And I'm not here uh, to solve for politics. I'm here to solve for public safety and public health. We have Laura Mahoney of Bloomberg Law. Hi, this is Laura Mahoney of Bloomberg Law. Hey, are you um, quantifying or, or looking at what the economic impact would be to state revenues? And then are you considering any kind of other economic stimulus type measures um, to address uh, the, the downturn in the economy that this could? So it was just a few weeks ago, let me answer that specifically, but first let me contextualize uh, the, the world we're living in. Uh, I gave my state of the state a few weeks ago. I made the point where I have 119 consecutive months of net job growth, record low unemployment, record reserves, 
bond rating that's the highest it's been in two decades, and running an operating surplus that we estimated conservatively at $5.6 billion. I mentioned 24, 48 hours ago uh, that uh, we had anticipated uh, a slowdown in the growth of the American economy, and we had referenced, or rather, we had incorporated that into our January budget. I referenced uh, to a number of you individually, now I'll do it as a group, that our December and January numbers as it relates to the S&P and where we thought the markets would be uh, are actually higher than we had projected uh, in our January budget and that we had a good month or two of cash revenue that exceeded some of our early projections. We are uniquely positioned to meet this moment. That said, the economic disruption is profound and it is real and clearly it's going to have an impact uh, on our state treasury. Too early to determine what impact. You watch the markets like watching, you know, I don't know, whatever you watch, but it's, you know, it, it, when I sat down this morning, it was down 2,000. When I got out of the meeting, and one ten 10 minutes later, it was only down 1,100. So if we live in that moment of anxiety, um, then uh, my answer may change moment to moment. But I can just say this. As of yesterday, we were about 12% off our projections on the S&P. As I noted, the S&P was about, what, 3120 is where we expect it to be at the end of Q1 of this year. It's obviously not uh, in, at 3000 not on 3100 uh, But, you know, 12% is not 70%. It's not even the 20% that was identified through the bear market identification yesterday. So we're assessing that. Again, we're, we're in a unique position. California is a nation state. It's a dynamic economy, but it is an international state in this respect. We are interdependent. And trade and commerce and our ports of Long Beach, ports of LA, obviously we're number one in two-way trade, number one in manufacturing. That is going to impact the state of California. No one's naive about that. And of course, we are a dominant tourist economy. Hotels, restaurants uh, will struggle. All the conferences, tech uh, and the like that are canceling large conferences, all that will have an impact. All that will be assessed. Uh, but I'd rather be in our position, candidly, than many other states that were already running deficits and already uh, running uh, in the red in terms of uh, the general direction of their economies. So are you revisiting yet any of these kinds of Everything is being revisited in real time. You can imagine that Keeley is not just saying, hey, I'll come back uh, in May and then we'll figure about it. She is meeting with people 24-7. Lenny and his team have brought in the best and the brightest minds from across the country, quite literally. And when I say that, that's not one of those political throwaway lines. I mean some of the leading economists and experts in the United States that are advising Lenny, advising our budget team. And we are running scenarios not just on pandemic planning, public safety, public health, but also on economic conditions. And the wonderful thing about standing here in March and not in June and July or worse, August, is that we have a revise coming up that was going to happen on the natural and now will happen with all of this benefit of new information and we'll meet the moment. Governor, I know obviously we're just, we're, we're in this right now, but initially, how do you think our, the state's response is comparing to past, you know, health emergencies, SARS? Not, I think you know. we're doing, a, I, 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 I can't, I, I, I've been here, what? eight years, nine years now, lieutenant governor, governor, so I don't have the benefit of decades ago, but I do have the benefit of former Governor Schwarzenegger providing me information of considerations as it relates to our pandemic plans and some of his unique experience. I've had the ability not only to talk to him about that relationship to pandemic planning, but subsequently wildfires. Uh, governor Davis, the same on wildfires, clearly, obviously, Governor Brown. Uh, and being a student of our reactions in 2015, 17, and 18, as we had the three of the worst fire, wildfire seasons we've had in our history. Uh, we were second to none. And I say that because we have an all hazards approach to suppression, mitigation, uh, and recovery. And what that means is we don't just look at issues of wildfires, we consider wildfires and PSPS. We consider wildfires, PSPS, and earthquakes. We consider wildfires, PSPS, earthquakes, and pandemics. And the protocols and logistics and the operational uh, construct is very similar in those 
um, uh, those responses as they are in this response. That's why Mark Ghiarducci is point down at the Grand Princess working on logistics. His partnerships, hand and glove, not just with FEMA, but with the federal uh, military personnel working on these Air Force bases for other reasons and purposes. Uh, so I, I, I feel like the state is doing everything it can, and there's always areas for improvement. You'll find them. We'll find them before you find them. Uh, we'll own up to them, and we're constantly iterating. And as I said, I'm not happy with seeing some of the social media, some of those, you know, 60, 70-year-olds sitting on a bus waiting an hour, uh, you know, that's and not getting their essentials. Uh, but we're, we're trying to, in real time, improve upon all that. so many sick people and the healthcare system gets overwhelmed. Is that, I mean, is the state in charge of setting those standards and making those decisions? Are you deferring to your local governments? So how does that work? We, we, we have federal partners. We have the state expertise, state overlays, but we have plans that already play out those protocols in detail. We believe localism is determinative in terms of understanding the conditions on the ground. I say we're a nation state. What do I mean by that? That we are many parts but one body, but we are many parts. Rural parts of California, Northern California, are very different than some of the central, uh, uh, you know, some of the larger urban centers uh, in other parts of the state. And so conditions, criteria, their assets, their resources, human resources, physical resources are different and unique and distinctive. And so what we do is we are informed by locals and then we supplement our support with the state and federal government and we work hand in glove collaboratively. But in each instance, we have incident command protocols that are very prescriptive and well established. As I related to you on multiple occasions, including today, ASPR is the organizational construct working with the CDC that's incident command on the Grand Princess. So you look at that hierarchy of prioritization depending on what the incident calls for. So as it relates to cruise ship, it calls for a certain command structure. As it relates to, and we'll have to fill in the blank in your scenario, uh, we will have similar construct that is well established and resourced by personal relationships that frankly are more important than anything that exists in a large binder. Uh, and that's why I'm very grateful for these folks that are on the phone 24-7 building trust at the local level. Last question. Uh, well, I'll take advantage of that. <laughs> Thank you all. I hope to never see you again, but for better and more enlightened reasons, but we'll probably see you tomorrow. So thank you all.